All right. So it looks like it's live right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, numbers ticking up. My name is Bruce, and you're with us on A Girl, A Guy, and a Movie for our episode of Spaceballs, a movie that Janet has never seen before. And I had to remedy that. <laughs> I saw it now. Yeah, you saw it. Um, this this uh, this came out in the, the year 1987. I remember wanting to see it. And I, I guess I got to ask you first. Are you going to show this to, to your grandkids or kids? Is this a movie uh, you would? Maybe if they were older and they seemed interested in something like that, I might as a spoof from Star Wars. But to just say, hey, this is a great movie. I want you to watch it. No. <laughs> uh, it was it was funny in parts, but I didn't I didn't enjoy it as much as I was hoping it would. It, yeah, just, didn't, I, I, it just didn't. It wasn't something I'd, I would uh, really recommend to people for fun, you know, for comedy. Yeah, th this is this is a movie that I think it, it fits really well if you're like I'm a completionist. I got to see all the Mel Brooks movies. Like if somebody sees like History of the World Volume One, and then they watch Young Frankenstein, and they're like, "Oh my god, it gets better." There's Blazing Saddles. It it just like this movie is kind of after all of that, and it it just no, it it it's a it's got some funny parts to it, and. It, it's we watched a good comedy a week or two ago. And they're like, oh my god, it's better. Sorry, I turned my phone on. It always happens up in the line. <laughs> it, we're on brand. We're good. We're good. Um we always we always watch a it seems like we watch a really fun, a really great movie. And then the next movie we watch, it's like mm. And I kind of feel bad because we watched The Jerk last week. Mm -hmm. The Jerk is a, a fantastic film. Yeah, I heard you laugh a lot when you were watching it. I was, I'm was. i still talking about that movie. Yeah, it was but, good. Yeah, it's a great film. And mm -hmm. I go to from that to Spaceballs, I'm like, Spaceballs was funny in, in parts. There, there's parts of the movie that I, I didn't laugh much. And I wanted to laugh. Through all this, um, it's just must see for any nerfer. Absolutely, Bill does a really good job in mm -hmm. this movie with what he what he has. He's 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 an actor that reads a script. I don't feel he's like really super funny because if mm -hmm. he was really super funny, he would have been like improv improvapalooza, and he would have like started saying funny shit throughout the entire film. But we didn't get that, and it's it's kind of okay because. I mean, it's, this is not the only time that Star Wars disappointed us. Uh, there was, for me, Return of the Jedi, which that movie I don't, <laughs> I don't like. <laughs> and there before that, that was the holiday special, which I'm too young to remember. <laughs> but I, I like what I what I thought about Spaceballs. Um, comedy aside, I think the movie's great. I think the sets are good. I love the miniature work. There's some really good miniature work. The first fucking like minute and a half where the space ball one flies by the camera and you just see all the details of the, of the model they used. Yeah. It's like, wow. It, it definitely did not look like uh, they lacked money. They It no. seemed like they had plenty of money for costumes, sets, makeup, uh, miniatures, uh, locations, uh, things like that. It didn't seem like they lacked any money. It was uh, it was just the and I loved I loved um, Rick Moranis and I really loved uh, John Candy. They were two of the people that stood out for the whole movie to, to me when it came to the comedy part. Yeah. They're the two that I laughed at. Yeah, and uh, and they made this movie on a staggering low, staggeringly low, twenty two million dollars, almost twenty three. And that's really good, really, considering how many stars they put in there. Yeah, well, that, that was that was a budget, I think, was the stars. But like when I yeah. started watching all the like the transitions and the mini miniature effects, that just surprised me. I mean, like that looks good. That still looks good. The fucking Mega Maid transformation still looks good. Mm -hmm. I I was very surprised, and I I just I I, I got to give Mel Brooks like this movie mostly holds up. 
Well, and one thing that surprised me, because I'd never seen this before, and I'd never really, I, I remember seeing John Candy dressed like a puppy dog or something, and the big giant hat uh, in, you know, on t-shirts and different things like that that people would wear for Rick Moranis. But I really, I didn't know anything about Joan Rivers' voice uh, as for being the changed, transformed <laughs> robot best friend for the princess or anything like that. So there was some things in it that I thought was, you know, pretty cute. Uh, it, you know, I can see where they got the, uh, what was it? The something of Oz or whatever, the one they did with Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. uh, I never saw that either, but uh, I can see. Was it a Mel Brooks movie too? <laughs> see, I don't uh, know. Uh oh, no. I, the Wiz, the Wiz. Mm -hmm. That's what it's called. Uh, but mm -hmm. the, I could see um, a lot of similarities uh, with all his other stuff that he's done. It was like it was like a, they took a, all these different movies and they squashed them into one and then threw it on the screen. Basically, mm -hmm. that's that's basically what I got from this. It wasn't like it was a specifically, uh, you know, separate or anything, you know, like it had a story to tell because basically there wasn't even a story, you know what I mean? It just seemed like uh, just, you know, random stuff all put together and, you know, I don't know. I, I, I really didn't get into any of the script or anything like that. It was uh, almost like going to a Broadway play, you know, kind of like thing to me. So, you know, it wasn't, I don't know. I just, there wasn't really a, any ebb and flow really in the story behind why they were going to take the air. You know, just, I don't know. I could see a lot they, of like, they told you the opening crawl, they, they just <laughs> want the planet's resources. Yeah. I, I was it. trying to read that on my phone because I started watching it. I'm all, I went to my computer after I was done getting dressed and everything, but, uh, uh, at first, I was watching it on my phone. It was really small, so I couldn't really see what yeah. that was being saying. Oh, hi, Dave. Um, and, um, you know, I wasn't really, I wasn't able to see that stuff. But uh, if it wasn't for John Candy and Rick Moranis, the probably, the, I probably would never, <laughs> probably would have made it through the movie if you want, if you honestly want to know, because I just didn't think it was very good when it came to any of the other uh, supposed laughs. You know, like uh, the seeing all the the dum dums running around, just being afraid of uh, of uh, Darth Vader's character or whatever his name is. Yeah, helmet or whatever. What did it, what was his name in this again? Uh, he was panicking, crybaby. Dark helmet. Dark, dark, dark helmet. Yes. <laughs> oh, the con on the Wikipedia as panicking, crybaby. Yeah. Which I thought that's fucking great. I never knew that. Uh, you have it was really, really corny and uh, lame. You know, so many parts of it. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Did they use the same sets as some of the movies were made on? Because it looked a it lot like, like it. it. But no, oh, they didn't. And they for the fucking set design, they they hired like the the best. <laughs> oh, you're gonna hate me, you little racism counter, but. They hired the best Jewish accountant to take the price down for the sets, but geez, they, those sets looked so good, and they they didn't throw a lot of money at the sets. Like they, you can tell they spent good money on the sets. But I, they had Bill Pullman, John Candy, Daphne Zuniga, Robert or uh, Joan Rivers, Rick Moranis. Yeah, they had tons of stars. That's why I said that the whole budget must have been spent spent on the actors. They had so much money in the fucking budget for the actors. Whatever mm -hmm. they did with the set design, they must have brought in all their relatives. I'm like, you're gonna look for peanuts. Don't even think about making no money here. You got it, it's it's a layoff anyway. You're gonna be out of work, and I'm gonna fucking send you to work, and I'll pay for the nails. Get to work, you carpenter. But not just the sets, the costumes. I mean, the co it didn't look like they went cheap on anything to me. I mean, it wasn't cheap. It didn't look cheap. It didn't look, uh, you know, fraudulent. Even the scenes where there was miniatures and stuff, it all looked like they'd spent a lot of money uh, making this movie. You know, even John Candy's costume, the detail on his face and, you know, everything. And throughout the whole movie, he, he looked like they kept him looking 
like his character, you know what I mean? And that's makeup. That was a lot of that was makeup. It wasn't like uh, he was wearing a mask, you know, like Rick Moranis has had a little shield he just dropped down. Yeah. You know? So I, I, I thought it was great. And uh, what was the guy, the one guy that was playing his secondhand man? That's was George Winter. He played Colonel Sanders, the commander of Spaceball. Oh, yeah. That guy. I've seen him in a lot of Mel Brooks movies before. That, that that guy is a talented man. He's yeah. Uh, just, no, there was, was a lot of actors that I recognized in this movie. I just it, I, you know I was surprised every time I'd see a new one, and then when I realized that was uh, Joan Rivers' voice, I was like, "What? She was in this movie?" I, I was surprised because I I was shocked how many people that I didn't know were in it because I knew that you know the, like the four main characters or whatever, Mel Brooks. Um, Bill Pullman, you know, and the uh, what's his name, Rick Moranis, and John Candy. You know, I knew those four because those are the ones that everybody talked about. But all the other people that just were here, there, and whatever, I was really surprised because I wasn't expecting so many stars. I mean, it was it was star-studded movie, the whole movie, and then at, at the ending parts when they put the other little bits and pieces of other movies, you know, like when they crash landed, you know, and all that stuff. So there was a, a dotted, a lot of comedy that was dotted through that I laughed out loud over because it was really funny. And I, I love the opening scene inside the RV with um, John Candy cooking in the kitchen <laughs> when I saw what he was wearing. I couldn't stop laughing. It was hilarious. I, he was like a giant Ewok dog or something. <laughs> And he was funny. You know, he's just naturally funny. He just, he can just walk through a room and just make facial expressions and stuff and, and people would laugh. I just know it. And same thing with Rick Moranis. Uh, so having them two in it is what made the movie for me uh, that made it even, you know, enjoyable at all. So they're two people that just are funny, no matter how shitty of a role they might have, you can't help but laugh at them because they're just so talented. At least that's how I saw it. <laughs> Now, the girl that played the, the princess, uh, you know, she, anybody could have played her part to me. I, I mean, I, I didn't think she was very memorable at all. Uh, that is, is, that, that's the most memorable movie she's been in, unless you include the slasher film, A Dorm That Dripped Blood. But that's, that's, that's it. That, that's she looked it. familiar to me. I just couldn't. You Did know, you ever see The Sure Thing with John Cusack? Uh, I think I saw that, but it was one of those movies. Was it a romance comedy or something? It's a summer comedy thing. Okay, well, then it was something my sisters wanted to watch, and I just watched it with them. And that's probably why I don't remember that much about it because that's what they like that you know, the something of the traveling pants and stupid shit like that. That's what my sisters like. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's not my type of stuff, but I have watched stuff like that because that's she what they was, want. She was also in the really bad sequel, The Fly Part Two, with Eric Stoltz. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's like the, the most popular shit she did was Spaceballs, I think, because that's the one that everybody saw her. That That's the movie that when I'm looking at her. Okay, list, but I just yeah. didn't think she was memorable. I mean, she just, you know, and, uh, you know, Bill's part was okay. There was some okay lines in it, uh, but he was so it was almost like. Uh, when John Candy walked into the, I guess the, um, uh, what was the pilot part of it, their little RV, right? Mm -hmm. Where he was in the front. And when he walked in asking him if he wanted some of that food, that was funny. But then it was like when he was sitting in his chair, except that whole scene seemed like it was a skit on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. It was so, um, you know, just not. I don't know. It just was not very impressive to me. That scene was not. He just didn't seem like he was, was hap that happy to be to be in that movie <laughs> to me, well, as he was in Independence Day. See, he yeah. kicked ass in that movie. And I was expecting, when I saw who it was, I was expecting something like that, more, I don't know, more believable or something. So I just, I didn't think he was that impressive in that part either. I mean, he did good. He wasn't at the bottom. But no. uh, John Candy and Rick Moranis were at the very top of this movie t to me. They were the two that made the movie even bearable <laughs> and funny. Yeah. I, ones I, I, I think her film, her film career, 
like the sure thing and space balls of what people mostly recognize her from. But you're right. I mean, her character was fairly much kind of blase. Mm -hmm. She's she's funny, but there's there could like the, the part where she's got her little space headphones on. I laughed at that. Yeah, that that part where she's in the ship when she's leaving. Yeah, when she took that off, I was like, "Damn, I wish I could have done that with my hair. That would be cute." But I didn't have, you know, I didn't have any time to do that because I hadn't seen the movie, so I didn't realize that was a that was a cute prop, though. I yeah. love that. I thought that was seven funny. years later. John Candy died. That sucked. Yeah, I know. I loved him and Uncle Buck I, in so many movies. We could do a whole month just do his movies. He's just a dozen movies that John Candy was in that I would get vehemently opposed to any remake they tried to do. Like if somebody tried to remake uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, mm -hmm. I would like, I would be just as pissed off as whenever The Last Jedi was in theaters. And mm -hmm. people, you want to see that movie? Yeah, go fuck yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's just iconic. I mean, he's just good at everything he did. I, I never saw him in a role where, I, where he wasn't good. I mean, he was good in this movie. And mm -hmm. so was Rick Moranis. Even though the movie wasn't good, they were good. They were talent. I'm, I'm not going to say the movie wasn't good. Like, there's... Uh, okay, we're no, just... the movie was okay. It wasn't uh, the worst movie. Believe me, it wasn't the worst. But it wasn't... Uh, it was. It's lower on my totem pole than my normal stuff yeah. that I would have picked. But I remember I, what I said. I'm not a real big comedy person either. I don't watch very many comedies. Very few, like the jerk. Is, See, you know, that surprises up. me because you're such a funny person. I mean, I, your head, your why head. I'm picky. You know what I mean? I, I'm yeah. very picky about when I go see stand up, if, if, they got to be good. They got to make me laugh a lot. And if they don't, it's like, eh, you know, I won't go see them again. See, I'm, I'm very picky when it comes to comedy. See, I bet you would, <laughs> I would, I bet you would enjoy Matt Rife. I don't know who he is, but I, I probably would if he was really funny. We'll I love video. good stand up. Somebody who's like fast, like Jeff Foxworthy. You know, he he knows how to talk to the crowd. He knows he just knows he just knows what he's doing. Uh, Ron White. I love him. You know, I've seen a lot of good comedians. Dana Carvey. I saw him live as a church lady and uh, he was hilarious. So, you know, I'm just saying I'm really picky. I went and saw Damon Wayne's, but I missed half of it because I went with my mom and my mom was making noise the whole time trying not to hear him because he was so dirty. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it's it's just, you know, this, I like adult humor too. I think adult stand up is if you're, it's all grown ups. I think that, you know, I expect it to be funny and make fun of everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tim <laughs> Allen used to be a dirty comic and then he had that TV show, Home Improvement. Yeah. He goes mm -hmm. to do his first fucking stand up, or the, the the month after that show like ends its first season, he's on stand up circuit, and he starts to do the bits, and he sees like nothing but kids in the audience, and they want to see Tim the Tool Man Taylor, and he's like, Fuck. yeah, <laughs> I guess yeah, that's, that's what my mom when she won tickets to go see Damon Wayne's, uh, she liked his show. What was it called Mom and My Wife and Kids or something? And she was yeah. like, I want to go see Damon Wayne's. And I was like, Mom, his stand up is not like on TV. And she was like, I don't care. I want to go see him. So we went. She was like, That was terrible. She hated it. But I laughed at my mom through the whole thing because she could not believe what she was hearing. And it changed her whole perspective on him. But, you know, that's what you got to, you know. That he's good. He's good at what he does. There's That's nothing wrong with being dirty, Kronos. <laughs> no. There's time and place for everything. Um but, it just that, you, you know, my mom was uh didn't was not expecting that. She was expecting what she saw on television, and she got the FF and G D and the fuck and you know, all the <laughs> all the other languages. She was not expecting it. So yeah, it's it's overwhelming for some people. But when you when I buy a ticket, I expect it be entertained you know when i'm there <laughs> and get my I'm money trying to make you feel a little better uh rick moranis did not <laughs> retire from acting his wife died so he took time off to be a dad oh yeah he he's he's a real man his wife died around 2007 or 2008 what happened to her i don't know she died and then he went and did an episode of the goldbergs mm -hmm. and he's doing uh, some stuff for ryan reynolds's mint mobile 
And now he's got the pre-production set up for Shrunk, which is the same character he had for uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, I believe. Mm -hmm. I thought they made two of those movies. Yeah, Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves. Um, there, there's, there's another. Oh, yeah. Bob and Doug McKenzie's 2-4 anniversary. Yeah, that was good. Wayne Solinsky, yeah, this is supposed to be a sequel or in that trilogy of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. Yeah, I blew up the kid. Yes, yeah. he's got a few of them. It's, it's, it's a Disney property, so I expect there to be thousands of these. Yeah, movies. I loved him in uh, Ghostbusters uh, as the dorky nerd, you know, accountant or whatever it was that he, he had that job. I just mm -hmm. thought he was great in that movie he was just really really funny and i laughed a lot in ghostbusters it was really good funny comedy and you know it's it's hard to beat when you when you watch really good stuff like that and then watch something like this just like you said compared to his other movies mel brooks movies it just wasn't uh up there you know yeah. like the I'll, I'll give my rating early I'm, I'm giving this movie a 65 out of 100 it it almost passes like in in uh, 1980s, uh, 65 out of 100 on a report card would be, oh, you failed. But in 1990s, we had to start padding shit. So 69 <laughs> or less is, or 65 to, to 72 is now a D. And uh, I consider this movie a D because it, it has its parts, but the, the entire thing just doesn't come together. It's a weak script. It really is. The, the comedy should have hit. There, there's, there's a lot of funny in Mel Brooks and you can't tell me he used up all of it, but then again, I haven't that watched was, it. That was where I saw fault, is that it was like, like I said, it didn't seem like there was an actual script. It was just a bunch of, they just took a bunch of this, that, and the other, and like, and then threw it out there. And yeah. it just, it wasn't, it, that, it was very uh, cluttered, you know, cluttered. It wasn't, you know, there was like one or two parts, you know, like this, the whole scene where he's cooking and stuff in the RV, all of that and then the like the scene in the diner and then uh, a few other little scenes here and there seem like actual script writing or whatever. Yeah. But then the rest, it just seemed like they took whatever jokes, you know, as many slapstick, get, put every single slapstick you could think of in this one scene, or something like that. That that's what it seemed like. It was jumbled and, uh, you know, you know push crush together like mm, this just get some play-doh and cram it all together and stick it over there and put it in that egg for some kid you know that that's basically uh what i felt throughout most of the movie except uh certain scenes that had john candy in it and then other scenes with rick Moranis, uh they were good uh like the scene where um at the end where they had mel brooks dressed up as like yoga or whatever they called him uh, yogurt. yogurt. I just thought, you know, it was just a, it, it, they went through a lot of stuff to get him dressed up and everything. It's just that it was so worn out by then, you know, that it wasn't as, as funny as it could have been if you'd actually had a better script leading up to that character or something. I don't know. I just, it just didn't bowl me over like I was hoping it would. That, so. That's the big, big problem about <laughs> That it, that was a problem back in '87 when critics kind of dissuaded my parents from spending money on it. Mm -hmm. And when I saw it in '89, I laughed a lot, but it wasn't as funny as I thought it could be. And mm -hmm. I, my dad's like, "Well, write a better script," and I tried, but I couldn't write a better script. And so I just was like, "I'm 14. I I can't. It's fine, whatever." But we for what we got you know i mean i i got some really good parody stuff out of this this has that alien bit this has the uh yeah. my baby bit with following the alien uh, uh emerging from john hurt william hurts or yeah that was funny that was, that was when that was when the good. spotlight went on it and it put a little hat on and started doing the whole scene that you saw i remembered it was from a cartoon from a bugs bunny cartoon with this singing frog bit yeah, that's what it reminded me of. I don't know if that's what it was supposed to be, but that was the only thing that I thought of when I saw it. And I was like, that is funny. Now, see, that 
took you away from the rest of the stuff and it was funny and corny at the same time, but it, that's what I was expecting throughout the movie. But I had big gaps where there wasn't anything. It was like, uh, they were just added seconds for no reason, just to add time to the movie instead of trying to put something in it. They'd have like five or six slapstick things all crammed together. And then they had like 10 minutes with nothing. You know, I, I don't know. I just didn't, it didn't flow very well for me. Yeah. Kevin flow was off. <laughs> something I found funny. Um, yeah, I think that's great right there. This, that is, whole thing. this was designed by ILM. Mm -hmm. ILM did a lot of the transitions. So they put the Millennium Falcon in the movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> 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 Little things like that is what made it really good. But I loved the fact that they had a uh, like an old Winnebago. <laughs> That they'd made into a ship. I thought that was so funny. I laughed at that at the very beginning when I first saw it. I was like, this is this is going to be good. And, uh, you know, it, it kind of was like I didn't watch a trailer for it because I didn't want to I didn't want to set myself up for failure or anything. I didn't want to watch anything. So I tried not to look at anything or read anything or anything to, to understand what was going to happen. But um, it was have you ever watched a trailer of a movie and you're like, oh, my God, it's so pumped. It's going to be great. And then you go see it and there's nothing more than what was in the trailer in the movie. And you just go, what? All I had to do was watch the trailer and I already know the whole movie. So I hate it when I leave a movie uh, and I feel like that. And, and to me, they had a, a plethora a buffet laid out in front of you with all these great scene, you know, scenery, costumes, actors, I mean, all that stuff. And they didn't have a script. You know what I mean? It, it had everything. It, the editing was even good because it flowed and the music and everything went together well, except it didn't have substance. It just had a no there's no plot. There was no, you know, it was just lame. The script was lame. It was like yeah. a, a, you know, a nothing burger. <laughs> if they'd had a script with that many talented people, it could have been kicked butt. I mean, I really think so. Now, George Lucas, because of him liking the movie so much and adding his production company to help with the, the transitions and some of the, the transitional set design, mm -hmm. the, the agreement was made that not a single dime of this movie could be made from merchandising. Mm -hmm. They could joke a fuck about it. They could they could joke about it till the cows came home, but there mm -hmm. were not going to be any Lone Star or uh, or Dot Matrix dolls at at, at the, the store. You, you just couldn't buy them. If yeah. If anybody ever shows you they've got a Lone Star doll, they have kit bashed it. They have done more work than anybody at Kenner could have because they have taken their love and turned it into sweat and tears and made it their own, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. But you you aren't going to see a, a Eagle One at the store next to the Millennium Falcon. They they just they agreed not to do that. Um, yeah. The the two jokes that that Mel Brooks was happiest about is Spaceballs the breakfast cereal and Spaceballs the T-shirt. All the merchandising jokes they had in this film and then, yeah, they were you know, the, the the fact that he was able to like hey let's get a mock up of a VHS tape and have <laughs> that on the shelf. And he's like, those were the things that he loved the most. Mm -hmm. uh, what, he, what Mel Brooks hated was the fucking the the makeup for yogurt, the gold stuff gave him a rash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had, to, they had to film all that stuff out of sequence. Yeah, but that they made. I mean, but see, the stuff is they had everything they needed to make it a great movie because they mm -hmm. had. Uh, all, all the, the behind the scenes, whatever that Mel Brooks just comes up with. Okay. Cause he's one of those people that can see something and something funny will pop in his head because of it. You know, unlike most people like John Candy, I guarantee that John Candy could see anything and make comedy out of it. I mean, he's just that talented. Okay. That's the kind of person he was to have him, Rick Moranis and Mel Brooks together and then have it be that doll it was shocking to me because i was expecting more from it just because of those different people that were in it but all i saw was the same lame thing over and over again it was like they've beaten a dead horse with the same 
boring <laughs> uh, slapstick, you know. Uh, you can only watch so many, you know, people getting tripping on a banana, you know, like someone sliding on a banana and then it happens every two minutes. You kind of get sick of seeing it by the end of the movie. And that's kind of how I felt about some of the scenes with the dumb, dumb stormtroopers, you know, like the, now the asshole stuff, that was funny. Yeah. You know, when one guy goes, he goes, who's this asshole? And he goes, well, I'm so-and-so asshole. See that whole thing that wasn't along. Now that was funny, but that took time to write down on paper. And then everybody in the back, because, you know, like that, what was it? The, the Clone Wars, they were all related because they're all clones. So that's what made that funny for people that know Star that, Wars. That's a joke that happened after the fact because this movie was made long before the Clone Wars. Yeah, I know. But what I'm saying, I watched it years and years later. I wouldn't know that that wasn't connected to that is what I mean. Yeah. Because it was funny because all of them were related, you see. Uh, little things like that is what made it funny. And it could have had way more in that if they'd spent, if he'd spent time on the script to fill in all those gaps, because there was so many gaps where, you know, just like you said earlier that you, that you went through periods of time where you didn't laugh or anything, because it was like, you know, you're waiting for something and it doesn't happen. <laughs> so that, that was what I was saying. And uh, they didn't. And the fact that the two romantic characters really didn't have any chemi chemistry either, you know, yeah. uh, that was sad for me because I, I was hoping there would be, a spark like when they were arguing about i don't want to see him he's going to be a short ugly guy or whatever and then he was saying she's going to have buck teeth and whatever else and then they see each other and they're both shocked that they're not dogs that they're actually attractive i was hoping to have some kind of you know go off but mm, i didn't see <laughs> i didn't see any so you know but i'm not seeing it wasn't it, it's just my point of view. I'm not trying to take it away from anyone else. I'm just giving you my perspective of what I just watched. And mm -hmm. I just was wanting more there that wasn't there. So, you know, I'm not trying to be too, too bad, but can't help it. You know, <laughs> especially comedy. Comedy is one of the hardest movies to make. You know, it really is because you've got so many people to please uh, from different perspectives of like, you know, like I said, I don't, I thought Jackass sucked, you know, all the TV shows, Jackass TV shows. I just didn't, I never really liked them, but almost all my friends thought, Oh my God, that's the funniest show on television. I'm like, what? But I loved the man show. I thought the man show was freaking genius. And I loved it. I thought it was great. The girls on trampolines in slow motion, you know, jumping, just dumb, corny shit like that. But it was funny, you know, and it it, it hit it hit just at the right place, you know, as like like it's supposed to to get you to laugh about it. So it was like uh, in time, you have to have a a routine about how you lay it out to get the to build up to the laugh. And it, it just seemed like I kept waiting. There was a build up, but then nothing. You know, it was I was. I don't know. I just was a little bit disappointed over that part of it. Yeah. Um, this this movie, it, it's not in my, my favorite comedies. It, it's nowhere near the top. It's nowhere near the top 20. But is this a movie that's fairly important in the scheme of things? Not mm -hmm. really, but it's still got some stuff in there that like it elevates it above the standard comedy because it, it does a very good job of like just set design, costuming, and Mel Brooks has his hand on so much in this film yeah. that you can see the care he's got. It's just I don't know, like what the what was the design behind the script writer, like being whoever it was, whoever wrote the script. Like they had some good ideas, but there's also like forty pages of shit that just don't really translate well. And it was like it was like um, a person had a script or something, or had an idea for a script. And they sat down in a room like sometimes when they do these comedy shows at night with these skits and things like that. Like uh, if you ever watch some of the documentaries on Saturday Night Live, you know, from the beginning on through about how they just sit around and they're all like throwing ideas out there and they come up with different ideas. And some of them are real big hits and then others are not, you know, like I, I thought you were going to talk about where like John Belushi is playing Beethoven and there's a pile of cocaine on the, the piano. And then he's playing the piano and he snorts cocaine and the audience laughs because they get the joke. But John Belushi also likes snorting cocaine. Yeah. So <laughs> there's, 
Like I, I thought you were going to talk yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, stuff like that, though, is what I mean. Is that you're, you got a room of people, like seven or eight people, and they're all sitting around throwing ideas out there, and then they're taking notes and stuff. And then by the halfway through the thing, someone will say, yeah, this is a great thing. Let's write a script around or a skit for that or let's write a skit for this and then they'll sit and work together and you have you know five or six people putting information in to write the skit which is a short script right that's what it is because you're going in you're acting out whatever it is and then sometimes it's really funny like they ended up with cone heads and then you had the one where um uh what was his name chevy chase or whatever would grab her and rub her head give her a noogie or whatever you know these mm -hmm. little things just like on mad tv when they came up with stewart and the mother you know you, you don't know what's going to hit until you get it written and you get it out there and it's whether the people latch on to it or not you know the people that are watching the show but the thing is this one it seemed like they had all these ideas but nobody latched on to anything to expand it they just kind of took that group of little slapstick stuff and threw it in there and mixed it in uh, instead of making more of a story around it or something. I don't know. It just, it, it was like, it fell flat in a lot of the areas in the movie. Now there were a lot of good things that I thought were really funny. Uh, but, um, you know, to me that just, it, it brought the movie down so many notches that it was hard for me to get back up to the laughing where I was after, after the scene with me laughing and him cooking in the RV and everything and seeing him and stuff. I didn't, I, I didn't, I couldn't get that, that high back again. It was really hard for me to, to get back there again. So, you know, and the whole scene with the lightsabers and he called them noodles or whatever it was, cause they made so much fun of Jews. There was so much Jewish, uh, picking on Jews comedy <laughs> in that whole, a whole bunch of stuff in that movie that they did. So uh, you couldn't do that today. You couldn't, you couldn't make a lot of these jokes that they made in this movie, but it was funny. You know, the I whole, thing with the, the penis, you know, the way they held their lightsaber and it came out. Yeah. <laughs> and all that, you know, I thought it was funny. I, the, I, the plastic. I didn't have a problem with the, the, the penis jokes or the Jewish jokes or. You know, no, I didn't either. I was just well, Brooks is a fucking comedy maestro, uh -huh. and the guy has made his bones making fun of everybody, which is great. I think that's what a real comedian does, where they just like take funny stuff and they like verbalize it. They they put it out there, and I I think that's the crime of 2023 and 2020s in general, where we've criminalized making fun of certain people because heaven forbid some people might be in a fucking sacred cow club, and that's the last thing that you need in a society, you know, I mean, no wonder, no wonder we have so many problems going on in America today. We can't make fun of the, the dumb shit we see all the time because I know. The people doing the dumb shit are, are in charge. Now that was what was refreshing to me uh, in a lot of this movie. I, I was waiting for more, wanting more. I, I felt like I was uh, at the bar going every time he'd walk by going, you know, trying to get his attention to get me a drink. And he just kept passing me up. That That's how I felt. I felt, uh, I just felt like I was hanging, left hanging, wanting more of something to happen. And then nothing did happen when, and that was sad because he, with the talent that was in this movie, I was ex just expecting something more. And that I was kind of a letdown on that part of it, especially since it was Mel Brooks, you know, um, I don't know. I just was hoping for more and left with nothing. I mean, to me, that was bad, especially since um, uh, Star Wars. How many movies had come out? It was like there was two, right? There was three at this point. At this point. Okay, there was. Okay, I, I thought there was only two, but but the thing is, is that they had plenty of material to write uh, a good script that could have been really funny. I mean, to me, Ice Pirates was like way higher on the on the laughing Richter scale than this movie was. And I, that was, you know, to me, that's sad because John Candy deserved and Rick Moranis together deserved, you know, at least a eight, you know what I'm saying? For script to me. Hey, draws. So. Yeah. I'm sorry, Power 9000. I only have so many hours to be awake on a Sunday and I'm going to go to bed here very shortly. Um, it, 
the, this movie got so many good parts to it. Just it frustrates me on on a level of like mm -hmm. it's always frustrated me because Spaceballs is rife for like good comedy, and they could have even gone further with the Jews in space motif explored within the history of the world volume two, and they were going to do Space Jews part two, and they kind of do here, which it's great. But at the same time, you have 15 minutes of funny in a 90-minute film. Mm -hmm. And I I wanted so much more. I, I, I'm not trying to be a picky bastard or a picky bitch, however you want to verbalize it. But, like, this movie, it, it has good set design. It has great costumes. The Everything but the script, it, it everything but the script in this movie is, is great. But you get to where... You're watching the film, and it's just not the funny you wanted. It you have minutes pass by without funny. It's like being on I a know. live stream, and there's silence. Six mm -hmm. people on a panel, and they're all just texting each other or playing Candy Crush. Like, fuck! Mm -hmm. I didn't pay for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was hoping for more, but um, you know, can't. I can't just make it happen, you know, it's because you want it to happen. Uh, I was expecting something else, but I never got it. So, you know, I'm definitely not going to rate this as high as uh, I would, you know, something, some other movie that did fill, fill in the gaps. Even if they weren't perfect, they tried to put something in there. And this one just seemed like it had too many lulls, you know, so that was sad. And they, they tried to smash this movie and and history of the world volume one together and be like, okay, well, this is this mm -hmm. is this people. It's like, no, 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 no. We could have done so much more. Yeah. And yeah, they could have done. Th thanks for stopping in, guys, with Mockany. And if you guys want to watch us to the end as we cry about lost opportunities, <laughs> I mean, this is like we had Hun we had Harrison Ford, Luke Sky or Mark Hamill. Mm -hmm. Fisher and Billy Billy D. Williams all alive, and we could have had them together in The Force Awakens to turn mm -hmm. over the entire mantle of Star Wars to those miserable non uh, non talented actors, and and we could have given them that, but we would have had at least an image of them in Millennium Falcon enjoying themselves for one last set together, and they just completely dropped the ball. This movie is about as much of a miss as The Force Awakens is for me. And that's mm -hmm. why I'm rating this movie a high 65. I pray I don't lower it any further because this, this movie, it, it could be so much better. There's so many funny jokes that are out there and they wasted the script on so many things. Joan Rivers is a com comedy queen and you could have just made half the movie of her walking around and the mime that played Joan Rivers' Dot Matrix, the, the lady in the costume, uh -huh. would have perfectly pantomimed everything and done it right if the script would have been good. Yeah, I thought that, that her character was great. I thought it was refreshing. I wasn't expecting it, especially when I heard uh, her voice come out of the robot. And some of the lines, like when she's in the desert and she's talking about uh, getting sand in, 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 her, in her joints and her her you know, and stuff like that. I just thought it was funny. And then she's like, oil, oil, you know, when she was thirsty. And it was, it, she, they did a good job giving her that character. I thought that was refreshing. And it was, I thought it could have been comedic gold. I mean, it really could have, uh, because you're right. There, there was so, that's why I said there was so many good actors in this movie. You had a buffet just sitting there waiting for you. And they just, they did nothing with them. You know, they didn't use them to their uh, umph degree that they could have gotten from it because it was just so much there. That That's why I said the whole budget had to be spent just on the actors because um, that's a, that that's not very much money to make such a good movie with that many <laughs> big comedy people in it, you know, involved and to have it not be that. Uh, what is it? I'm going to hide here for a bit. <laughs> Mockany is making them listen to screaming jackasses. <laughs> hey, Megatron. <laughs> yeah, that was funny when they said Transformer, too. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I just, 
I, I thought there was a lot of really good lines in this movie. It's just it didn't have a script to build up to it, you know, to each of the lines to make them iconic type of thing. Uh, it, it was I just saw a lot of wasted time and space that could have been way better, way more right. successful. I, I hate to sound like me and Janet are just beating up on one of your favorite childhood <laughs> comedy movies, but we really are. I'd it's never seen it before. See, that's the thing. I was ex after all these years hearing people talk about different scenes. Uh, I was expecting it to be just higher, a higher up. I'm not giving it as low as you. I'm going to give it a seven. Uh, and that is because this the scenes were great. The scenery was awesome. The actors were phenomenal. Okay, and the costumes, the clothing, the hair, um, the uh, the miniatures, you know, uh, the special effects with the lightsabers and all the other stuff was great. It was all top notch. It didn't it, it didn't look cheap. It didn't look like a, you know, uh, there's, you know. There's, one, there's one other spot I'm going to ding it on. Okay, and that's the opening score that has the funny pew pew sound effects in it. Oh, I I told you it was hard for me at the very beginning because I was on my phone. The, the first couple times you hear the pew pew, it's okay. The 30th time you hear the pew pew, you're yeah. you're like, all right, this is bad. This is like Last Jedi bad. But um, you know what? Some of that, though, I think they did it intentionally, you know, they, to they make fun of it. Did. So they probably did. They, they did not have the good script money for, they didn't have the money for John Williams to come in and do his own signature sound, which mm -hmm. would have been probably in complete juxtaposition for the rest of the movie. Yeah, so, I was talking about that. Uh, Wolf Media was talking about it. I, I thought that was a great scene. And uh, the the asshole scene that, that went, who is this asshole? Oh, I'm so-and-so asshole. Private <laughs> asshole. That's me. Yeah, asshole. Was, yeah, and then the, the whole back of the ship was filled with assholes. So because I'm surrounded by assholes, I thought it was great, you know. So it had, it had shining moments, but it, it sh the whole movie should have been like that with the people that were in this movie and a director would like him. It, it should have been up way up there, and it wasn't. And I, that's what made it made me sad about it is because it had a they had a buffet, <laughs> and they just put the lamest stuff on it instead of using the buffet to its maximum. And that's sad to me. I mean, it was just. This, this is like going to one of those like $35, $40 Brazilian buffets. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. And mm -hmm. they just bring chicken by. And like, no, I want. Yeah, beef. Get beef. <laughs> Where's get the beef? beef? Where's the beef at? You know, and now we're back to Wendy's. But I mean, it's just, it, it, this is, this is a shining example of, of this, like, sometimes you get a bad script and I don't, I don't understand it. It, this movie is the worst Mel Brooks movie that people talk about, in my opinion. There's worse movies he's got. There really are. And I, I don't recommend High Anxiety. If you ever see High Anxiety, I tried to warn you. <laughs> I did. I Honestly, I legitimately was like, no, don't don't see High Anxiety. That That's really a bad movie. But if, if, you, if you deny me, if you, if you decide to go see High Anxiety and it disappoints you, don't forget, Bruce tried to tell you, like, hey, this this is really a waste of your time. Because there's it's one thing to see an action movie that's not a lot of action. Like, sometimes the drama is good, or sometimes it can be un unintentionally funny. Like, you have a real groaner of a of a schlocky film. When you yeah. have a comedy movie fall flat, like, there's really not a lot you can do with comedy that's, like, just non-existent. Because they're not being dramatic. They're not trying to do much else. It's just... It's like you turned your television on to primetime programming in 2023 and they're just letting them go through motions. They're either PEI puppets or they're, they're people that are on an independent network, but they've got no talent to, to take whatever's in front of them and make it the funniest they can. And this movie, yeah. this movie should have had so many parts. It was just one missed portion after another. John Candy improvised a couple things. Uh, like when he gets up and he's like, oh, that'll leave a mark. That's improvisation. That's really good improvisation. <laughs> he's just talent gold. I mean, yeah. he, he he just can't make a, a bad choices. He's just good with anything he's handed. He just wasn't handed enough. 
You know, and he just wasn't handed enough script to do more with it. But in every scene he was in, it was entertaining to me. And mm -hmm. almost every single scene Rick Moranis was in was entertaining. Yeah. Uh, you got the, the, the well, dot yeah, good girl. actors with bad scripts that did the best they could with it and made those scenes good. Um, the, the part that I thought was funniest is that half the scenes where Dot Matrix is going around doing stuff, she's mm -hmm. got roller skates on. Uh, <laughs> I know. I loved it. I thought it was awesome. And you could tell in a couple that she glided along. And what was the woman's name that played his uh, the, the real hot blonde with the short hair? That was looking at his wee wee when he went when he was going to the bathroom. I pull this up. She like, was she was great. I loved her. I don't yeah. remember who she was, but she did every scene she was in. She stole the scene basically. She was great at what she yeah. did. She it's was, just that she wasn't in it enough, you know, to fill in the other holes. That Leslie that Bevis. Leslie Bevis plays yeah. Commander at Zircon. Yeah, she was good. She's she was talented. An amazing actress. It, it's a it, the, the, the sad thing is, kids, like whenever you start looking at um, older films, you start seeing all these people that are like, they're super hot in these roles. Well, huh. she was born in 54, so she's not a spring chicken. But, no, but she was a good in this movie. She's, she's just a very attractive, very striking woman there. She is there. Nice mm -hmm. little figure. But see, look at that, that right there, that scene when she looks down while he's holding his junk. Oh, God. That was if, so funny. If Bridget Nelson was like a hot woman, this would be it uh -huh. right here. And thank God for this one. This lady, like, she's, she's, the, like, that's come. There's a show of hands in the audience for men, like, yep, I'm fapping to that later. She's hot. Yeah, and, she was very attractive. And she was good. You yeah. know, she was a good actress. She so. was in the short lived show, The Tortellis, which is uh, the spinoff of Cheers that should have never happened. Yeah. Carla and her husband at home, which is a bad idea. Um, there she is again, looking like a rock star. She's on Murder She Wrote in '84. Amazing, mm -hmm. uh, good, good, good blow dryer, good, good salon work. Um, she is, she's just a very striking woman. She's just one of those few ladies. She's, she's a good about. actress too. She was very believable at her character, even though it was a comedy. Mm -hmm. She seems a, a very strong character uh, and she knew her business. You know, she was like when she was talking to him and stuff, she stood her ground. Uh, but she was funny. See, too, the look on her face when she looked down and was looking at him while he was holding his penis. You know, it was just funny. And, she, and she was fast, you know, yeah. and uh, made the scene flow like it should. So those two bouncing off each other, when you have two good actors bouncing off each other, it makes a scene, it pulls you in. It's like I said, that's the scenes that I had a hard time with, with the ones where it was kind of like, you know, like that, you know, you, you were waiting for something, but it never happens, you know? So, I, you know, I just thought that she was great. She did. And I, really I'm guilty of that myself but as a streamer. I'm, a, I'm completely doing that myself as a streamer because like there's been plenty of times I've been running a game or been running a stream and we asked something and then there's like 10 seconds of silence. Like, yeah. It, it can, like you can see the dead squirrel falling out of the tree after he gets hit by lightning. There's yeah. rock dead on the ground. Fuck. But you don't expect that in a movie. Okay. No. When it's live, you're going to have that. That just like Saturday night live or anything. You have these uh, little pause that happens. That's normal. That's going to happen. But in a movie, it's supposed to be edited out, but they couldn't edit out all the lulls because then half the movie would have been gone. You know, you gotta have something to put in there. And that's the part that was sad is that you had so much, meat okay you had so much meat out there on the buffet except no one was allowed to get the meat and you know it, it so the, it was like oh i guess i have to have fruit again you know it was it, that's what it was like and that's sad because it, it the potential was there it's just they didn't use it and i don't know why they didn't so i don't know you know i was I, let down for that part of I, it i i wanted i wanted this movie to be funny i wanted this movie to to be 
so much different than what it was and it just it 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 denied me and that's it's been like that for over 30 years and that's fine i'll live with it but i'm not super happy mm-hmm. and i just i i want to see I, I want to see Mel Brooks, you know, a, a funny Mel Brooks film that's more recent than this because I, I don't know when the last funny movie he was was made. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'd have to go through a list and this look because there's a lot of things you just forget about because someone hadn't mentioned anything about it. So, but it was, uh, it just was sad because it was so much talent in this one movie that was wasted because there was so many lulls, you know, there was nothing, uh, you know, nothing to put in there because there was, the script wasn't good. You know, it was, it was the script. You can, I don't blame the actors for any of this. I blame the director and the script because they just, they went limp. <laughs> they ruined it. They, they took ruined. away the mood, you know, the mood was there because I was laughing my ass off in that one scene. John Candy's uh, cooking up in the kitchen and, you know, the whole scene was great. And then after it kind of started going down and down and down, I was like saying, when's it going to pick up? Then every so often there was a couple things after that that was funny, it, but it never picked up t- for me, you know, after that. For those of you who want to know, um, Denise and Diane Gallup were the doublement twins of the mid to late 80s mm-hmm. that were in the film. There you go, gentlemen. Men of culture, go do your thing. <laughs> yeah, that that was a cute scene too. So there was, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, that kind of a, a comedy in the movie, but not enough. You know, they needed more. Yeah, the the this this is Mel Brooks we're talking about. I was expecting, I was expecting really good stuff. This felt like a, a Chevy Chase film. Yeah, it, definitely. Uh, there's there's whole minutes to go by without it being funny, and then like oh we get funny now for five minutes, and then it just it falls apart because this person leaves the scene, and we're waiting for Barf to get back on screen or Dark Helmet to get back on screen, and it, it wasn't it. Bill Pullman, he's he's really a good actor. I don't think he's good for comedy. I th- I think he's really good for for the dramatic roles he was in, and as much as the, uh, some people are going to lament this. I think he really did shine as a president of the United States and Independence Day. Yeah, that I love that movie. Crappy alien invasion film from the 1950s with better special effects. You mm-hmm. have Bill Pullman that kind of saves that film. And mm-hmm. think about it like, man, like the best scenes of that movie are with Bill Pullman, you know, and and maybe like the the crazy guy that takes his biplane into the into the UFO. <laughs> Well, the thing is, is that uh, he is a good actor and yeah. that's sad about uh, there was no to me, there was no chemical attraction between the two romantic characters. There should be there's something there. Uh, so I just didn't wasn't impressed with her. I just didn't think she was very good for that part. But uh, John Candy was the out that to me was the top build person in this movie when it came to comedy. He was funny. Uh, his his character was, uh, you know, entertaining, uh, and so was uh, Rick Moranis. He he did what I expected him to do. He made me laugh in this movie, and uh, you know, the, I got a few chuckles here and there from some of the other characters. But if you took those two characters out of this movie, or those two actors, the movie would be totally nothing. You know, I wouldn't even probably wouldn't even have laughed hardly at all at any of it because they were the two reasons why this movie was good. And uh, the actress that, 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 what was her name again? The real pretty blonde. Def, Daphne Zaniga. Oh, yeah, the real Daphne. pretty blonde. Leslie yeah. Bezen. Yeah. Leslie. Yeah. Was she in the hamburger movie? Was that the lady that was moaning at the table at the restaurant? <laughs> oh, that'd be great if it was. Let me, let me look. Here. I don't know, but she was attractive too. Remember? Mm-hmm. And she was a pretty good actress, so uh, that's what I said for a second. That's who it don't, could. Don't make her. fun of Hamburger the Motion Picture. That's a that's a fucking great movie. I mean, I'd never seen it until you made made me watch it. It was funny. I laughed. Yeah, but that, see, was it was a, funny. that was a good super chat. That was that was a great super chat. Uh, she was in. Ooh, wasn't her? Was someone else? 
Um, I'm scrolling through. Okay, I'm sorry. He's on an episode of Hard Castle McCormick. So if if that that means anything, she did two episodes of New Mike Hammer, Street Hawk V the series, After Mash, mm -hmm. Who's the Boss, Hard Castle McCormick, Kate Secret, Falcon Crest. No, no uh, movie. Uh, no, but, hammer, but, uh, movie. no oh, hammer, well. picture. But she she looked. She reminded me a lot of that woman. The, the, I, I'm. I don't blame you. She she reminded me of a lot of people. And it's no. like, yes, for all of them. <laughs> but the thing is, it was that, you know, you know, I can only give you the information that I felt from after watching this, uh, you know, what jumped out at me and what, you know, didn't. <laughs> so, you know, I was I was wanting more and I didn't get it. So maybe that maybe I put too much on wanting something more out of it. But, you know, it was a Mel Brooks movie. You know, who wouldn't put more on it? Yeah, Mel Brooks, uh, I'm going through his, his, uh, no, not, not that. Give me the producers. Give me the producers. Okay. Uh, he's, he's doing History of the World Part Two. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the series. And apparently it didn't do well. It's only a 5.6. Um, animated series for Spaceballs was made back in 2008 and 9. Daphne Zaniga re re resumed her role. By the way, he did mention in the DVD commentary that he uh, he kind of felt bad about all the Jewish jokes, but he's really happy he left them in there. And there's a there's a lot. Of yeah, that's what I said. There was tons of Jewish jokes in this movie, which I don't think he could do today. I Probably. mean, you can't make fun of anything anymore. It seems like you can't make yeah. a movie and laugh at people anymore or laugh at someone's religion or, or make cracks about anything it's just like you know so uh you know to get a movie like this today would be you wouldn't even get that you know it's just not going to get something funny it'd, it'd be rosie o'donnell playing bruce wayne or something some, yeah. some, some you know, twist something bullshit too. that we know couldn't happen the last funny movie he did was dracula dead and loving it and that movie still scored low on imdb uh, he he produced the remake of The Producers, which is a 1970s amazing film with Gene Wilder. Uh, got Robin Hood Men in Tights. That scored pretty well, 6.7. Yeah. Uh, baseball surprises me on IMDb. They gave it a 7.1. That that's really high for me. I I I can't I can't give it that. I'm giving it a 65. Be happy with a 65. I was thinking initially a 60, but I'm like, no, at least has to have a solid three stars in it. So. I did it. I, I bumped it a little bit, but I, I want this movie to be so much better. And I hate this movie for the fact that there's whole parts of time where I'm just painting figurines, not laughing. And I, <laughs> yeah, I, so. I hate that. Um, I was so mad about it. Every other aspect of it, I'm sure catering was good. I'm sure the I'm sure the onset hijinks was fucking great. But as far as the movie's concerned, like this movie could be like. This is a low point for Mel Brooks. And yeah. I, I didn't want this to be because he'd done other good movies. You know, he'd done uh, he, he, he'd done the cowboy. He'd done the uh, uh, horror and suspense with Young Frankenstein. He mm -hmm. even did the silent movie shit with the silent movie. And that that's not bad. But this movie, like, eh, I don't know. Like, and this was the 80s. This was a peak comedy. We had just had like airplane one and airplane two, the same, like in the last seven years. And yeah. how do you like, you, you want to be memorable. Like you were making a comedy movie, be fucking funny. And I don't know what happened to the script on this. The script just. Mel Brooks uh, wrote it and uh, must've had like a lot of like nights where he stayed up late too late, was watching some old episodes of the Tortellis or something. It just didn't hit. Yeah, I don't know. It seems like uh, for some reason he works so hard to help other movies, you know, other people's stories or whatever become successful, but he doesn't put the same amount of effort in the movie he directs. I don't know. You know what I mean? I, I disagree with that because he directed. Uh, no, this one, on this one movie is what I'm saying. He works so hard on these other ones and then he comes to his movie and he doesn't, he leaves all these gaps in it. See, I, you know, he must have had a lot of stuff going on in his life at the same time that he was making this movie because I just can't, I'm just trying to understand 
why he would have such a, a buffet of actors and a group of people around him and then let it have all these holes. You know, I, I don't know. It just, to me, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense <laughs> to have a buffet, but only put fruit on it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That's all I'm saying. It, because besides him, his script, uh, I can't find anything, any other reason in the, in the, uh, with the characters or the costumes or anything else. I can't find any other flaws of why the script would be so bad. That that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense that it's that bad. <laughs> it, it there had to have been something going on. It's the only thing I could think of. Yeah. Uh, that's a Mel. Is that a Mel Brooks movie right there too? Nope. Wolf Media was asking about Hot Shots Part Two, and that was 1993, my friend. 1993, a fantastic year. Mm -hmm. It's all right. The 80s, yeah, we miss the 80s culture. We we don't belong in that age, we're age bracket where we're at. All the favorites are keeling over from old age, and it makes you aware of how old we are. And two, like, time is just a relentless wall. It smashes you. And it just, you know, you're, you're not going to get the, the things you want. You know, you got to work for what little you get. And, I mean, you got to bust your ass for it. So. Yeah. It, that, that's kind of the theme of well, my anything, life right now. Anything worth having and keeping is something you, you, you work for because putting a little work in for it and earning, you know, it, it, as you go, makes it more that you want to hold on to it. You know, that you want to take good care of it because you worked hard for it. If someone just hands you something all the time, it gets to where it, it you know, I'm, I don't want to get political or anything, but you look around at some of these apartment complexes and stuff where people get to live for free. Uh, there's trash everywhere, graffiti on the walls. The place is trashed because it has no meaning to them. doesn't mean anything. When you work hard and you buy a home, you, you want to, uh, you, you're about to buy a home one day and then you'll want to mow and paint and keep your yard looking nice. Oh, might want oh, to pull up. You, 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 let me correct you on something. <laughs> I, I mowed a lawn from the age of 10 to the age of 18. And then when I got back from the service again until my 30s, mm -hmm. um, my parents always threw me the lawnmower, which I I look at a lawnmower the same way a runner looks at running shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I never want to touch one again. I'm yeah, but you will. I, you will. I, 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 I will hire the kid down the street. But what there. I'm saying is you're going to have pride in your yard because it's yours. Yeah. There's, there's a difference working hard for something and getting a reward. That's why I loved, I used to love watching uh, these different award shows, you know, when people would go up and get it. And especially if it was a really, really good um, movie or, uh, you know, a TV series or, or something like that, you were happy to see these people get nominated because you, you could see the work that they did to go into making it so great that so many millions of people wanted to see it and loved it and went and saw it again. So when you, when you, a movie like that gets nominated for something, you want to see it win because you know how much work went into it, especially people who understand thousands and thousands of people had to do stuff to get that movie to be successful, to even get it made. So that you could watch it. So um, I don't know. It just it's just sad to me that there's so much talent in this movie. And it, in this, if if, it, if the script had been better, it would have been it, it would have been a better movie. It's just the script was not very good. I but mean, no, I, like you said nobody was going to say anything because it's Mel Brooks. So uh, even though they were like, well, this is kind of flat, but I'm not going to say anything because it's Mel Brooks. He knows what he's doing. You see, that's what you would assume. But for whatever was going on with him at the time, um, it, it it just wasn't as up to par for him. I, I think he had a lot going on off scene. And yeah, I, I, really and I, I really think so. Had to have been because what other reason was there? So, you know. And, and, and I mean, there's a lot of shit to make fun of in Star Wars, like, you know, the brother and sister kissing and making out in the, the ice of Hoth. Which 
I mean, <laughs> Mel Brooks could have gone really hard into the paint on that one. Like, maybe mm -hmm. Prince Valium, her brother, and, like, you know, they, they start making out, and then, like, somebody's like, stop! Prince Valium is the, the son of your twice-removed brother, King blah, blah, blah. And, <laughs> like, the entire time, like, she's, like, making the audience hot with the various things that she's doing to poor Prince Valium, played by the very talented Jim J. Bullock, who used to be on the show, Too Close for Comfort. Google that. If you want to see fucking elderly people bitching about young people, Ted Knight sells it <laughs> so hard. You, you will have PTSD, my 30-somethings. You will have PTSD. And it, it's such a good show. And, and Jim J. Bullock is a funny man. And <laughs> entire action here was just to start to say something and, <laughs> yeah that's funny that's a good gag but he hits it four times and I'm like dude come on come on man come on do something funny you're James J. Bullock and he doesn't and that's kind of the entire movie that's the perfect synopsis of the whole film and and it just like they could have just knocked it out of the park with making fun of the potential incest in Empire Strikes Back just so many various things and this movie just as like, <sighs> whole minutes go by, I didn't laugh. And these miniatures, I, I mean, I'll show you. I just I just cleared off the tray of figs off uh -huh. of my, uh, and, and I've already got another stack of of new stuff. That this is the last two weeks, you know, Big Ass Dragon, Little Dragon, a bunch uh -huh. of people red. Got the, the Legion character that Chris wanted me to paint up for him. So. Yeah. Can't get the details come out of that, but you know what I'm doing, you know. And so if a, if a show sucks and I'm watching it, uh, you can be damn guaranteed that I'm going to be fucking painting miniatures. <laughs> it, like there's there's got to be something else. Like this this movie sucks, and I yeah. wanted it to fucking hit so hard. And I every it, this is like watching um, okay 80s kids, Jason the Wheeled Warriors cartoon should have been a banger of a show, mm -hmm. but. The show sucked, and every time I try to watch it, I get like six episodes in, and it just completely sucks. It, it's it's got everything. It had a good toy line, although the toy the toy figures sucked. The the vehicles were cool. Had a great opening soundtrack and ending soundtrack. It had it had some amazing talent behind it. The guy that wrote Babylon Five, J. Michael Straczynski, wrote Jason Wheel Warriors. But I watch it, and it just it never ever ever hits for me and it just completely falls flat like a flaccid penis in the middle of a m opening scene of a porn and you can't get no veins go oh it's my god so bad it's <laughs> so bad it's it and and that's like the comedy level of this film and i'm not trying to run it through the mud because there's a lot of great things about this film a lot of great things about jason wheel War wheel warriors but motherfucker this shit could have been so much better. Mm -hmm. and if yeah. you ever he dropped, the, he dropped the ball on it. I mean, he yeah. really did because um, I I was I was let down because I was expecting so much more with such a good group of comedians and Mel Brooks. You know, yeah. you expect a laugh a minute, you know, or something like that. And I was just I was sad about. I was you know let down a little because I left my rear end off when I first saw. Barf, you know, and he's cooking away in the kitchen and going to town, and then he brings, right? And uh, you know, and then it wasn't; it just didn't get better. You know, it just kind of went, uh, you know, limped along. You, you have and one of laugh, and then another laugh, but it wasn't. It just, and then the scene with the lightsaber scene when they're fighting, and uh, you know, with the. The whatever the Schwartz is or whatever it was he was calling it. Um, you know, it was funny, but it wasn't, it just never, it never it had didn't have a good pace. It was just up and then down, and then it stayed down, it kind of limped along. It was it, I don't know. It was just like a I, bad porn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it was, it was obviously little, porn not made by Pfizer. Uh, exciting. It wasn't, you know, a laugh a minute. It wasn't what I was hoping I was gonna get with all the hype that I heard about space balls, you know, I was expecting it to be a funny all the way through, but it wasn't. So yeah, and 
I, I, you guys are making are, are are probably snickering or something like you know like oh god Bruce is going off on Pfizer yeah I want to see <laughs> with Pfizer as the primary fucking uh, pharmaceutical company because I want to see like maybe three or four action scenes and then like both actors like have the fucking COVID heart attack <laughs> and it's oh, over it's okay. a combination porn and snuff film and yeah. you get everything dinner and a movie. And uh, you go home and you're like, see, kids, that's why drugs are bad. And you, you, you raise a good family. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> the thing is, it was nice to see a movie, though, that, that made fun of everything. You know, because Mel Brooks was making fun of every, it seemed like everybody was poking jokes at everybody, you know. Uh, and then the whole thing about, uh, what was it, uh, when he was talking about, he didn't know who he was abandoned as a baby, you know, all this different stuff. And he didn't know who he was and all that stuff. And then you have the the fake Darth Vader saying, uh, I know you, you know, I know who you are. And you're thinking he's going to say something like from the movie, you're my son or whatever type something or my nephew or what, I don't know, something. And then he just kept going on my friend of a friend my cousin, my cousin's somebody or whatever. And he just went on and on. And then he saw our, what does that make us? He went, nothing. Absolutely nothing. So see, there was fun. There was funny stuff in there. It's just that it was, there was huge gaps between mm -hmm. and the buildups to each of the, the jokes weren't, you know, it just was flat. So I, I really would be interested in finding out what was going on in his life at the time. Was he working on like six other projects? Was he uh, having problems in his marriage? I mean, you know, it's something because he just didn't seem focused on making sure that the script was uh, for this, a movie that could have been big. I mean, because Star Wars was huge. You think that his space balls would have been big, you know, even though he wasn't going to make a lot of money from, you know, any kind of memorabilia or anything like that. The part that pisses me off the most is that it's, it's I'm, I'm going to post it in the chat. Um, I'll have to read it, I guess. But uh, George Lucas complimented. Mel Brooks and said, if you had not decided to make a parody of Star Wars, but instead went with an honest to goodness, brand new science fiction movie franchise, uh -huh. this movie would have succeeded as a great adventure movie. Brooks said he was extremely flattered by Lucas's compliments and support. And that, that kind of pisses me off because George Lucas wrote star wars and empire strikes back and he he directed two of the greatest movies i've ever seen in my life i'm never going to say return of the jedi is up there because fuck that yeah. movie. but um, <laughs> i really i disagree with that because this movie is is okay it's it's it, it could have been a really good adventure romp yeah but mel brooks would have to turn it over to a second director all the damn time to get shit right because he doesn't direct good action he's funny he does good funny a lot but he's not the action guy he would have to have like a second unit directed by like gareth edwards or back then steven spielberg to do this and it would have been something really memorable really memorable and it just like the trivia side of the imdb i'll, I'll post this in chat you guys can go pick through here there's some good bones to gnaw on yeah i think i think this movie is like a lot of missed opportunity and i don't want to beat up on it that much more because i don't want to make it sound like i absolutely revile this film if it's on tv if it's on the internet and i'm not doing anything i'm going to watch it mm -hmm. and i think i think watching it to uh, i would fun. watch it again i'm not saying i wouldn't i mean there's a couple movies you and i watched and i said eh I don't think I'll ever watch it again because it was really bad because it was just more than just the script. Just because uh, John Candy and Rick Moranis is in this movie, I would watch it again. Okay. Because I love them. I think they're both comedy gold. I mean, they're funny. Even with a bad script, they're funny. So I would watch it simply because of those two actors. But uh, I just, I was just, I, I, I was just let down because I was expecting something more, you know, a more, more laughter in this movie, more comedy uh, than I was receiving. And that, that's the only 
let down for me in this movie. I mean, it's just like I said, the, the costumes, the actors, quality of acting was great. I mean, it was phenomenal. They, everything in this movie, everything was there for the potential of this movie to be huge. I, that's why I'm sad because it, it, the script wasn't there. Everything else to me was there except that the, the script was bad. It just didn't have enough, you know. You know, enough punch. Just didn't have enough punch to uh, make it a comedy gold. Like it could have. The potential was there because they had two movies of wonderful material to make fun of. And great laughs and awesome comedians in this movie. Joan Rivers, you know. Uh, I mean, they could have made like a budding romance between Joan Rivers and someone, another character. I mean, there was just if, if stuff Mario that could have done. No, it, it, the, the funny shit could have been like if Dot Matrix started hitting on Barf because she wanted to be have a furry in her. Yeah, <laughs> that would have been that would have been funny, been. you know. But there was potential. There was so much potential right there, right in front of us. It just that it just went, you know, this what wasn't used, and mm -hmm. that that to me because Mel Brooks is a genius. When it comes to comedy, it, it's it, there had to have been something going on. That's all I'm saying is I wish I'd had more time, you know, before we had a lot more time for us to, you know, dig around, find some good tidbits. But I would like to. I, I'm going to um, I definitely want to look it up and see because I really think I'm going to write it down real quick. So I don't like, forget. I want to look it up Fair and enough. see if something was going on at the time because it just seemed it just seemed. I don't know. It just it just doesn't make any sense. And I and I I'm pretty good. I think at saying that there's something was not right because it just didn't make sense the way it was put together or whatever. And we found out about the 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 fight between the two uh, executives at the the two different movie companies, and it all came back down to Paul Newman and his wife. You know, getting he got pissed off and said, F that guy. I'm a, I'm not going to help him or whatever. So it was like, you know, battles going on that we don't know anything about. Same thing with that other movie. Um, uh, the pirate movie that, that was okay. already $60 million in debt. Or, or no, you're talking about cutthroat Island. Which, yeah, yeah, and, we that great. That. and that was a great movie. I loved it. And that's why I said, why wouldn't people think this was a great movie? Why did it lose money? And we had to look into it and found out it wasn't even the movie that, it had nothing to do with why it didn't make money. It was all people that didn't even work on the movie. They were they were behind the scenes, the ones that were supposed to pay for shit, and they were all screwing around with the money and stuff before the movie could even, you know, get finished. So, you know, the movie was screwed before it even got put in the movie theaters. You know, it so really and and the sad fact is, is most people like us, we don't we don't have we don't have. Uh, a, a way to get in there and find out these details and understand it. Because remember, we I was talking about this not a couple of weeks back or whatever to somebody, and they said, "Well, um, I thought that movie was okay. Why was you know why was it such a bomb?" And I'm like, "It wasn't a bomb. It was a good movie. It's just because of who made the movie. The company that made it is the one that bombed the movie because they they were bankrupt, so they ruined the movie. So the movie was in the Guinness Book of World Records for the." You know, the biggest bomb, box office bomb, not because it was bad, because it was a damn good movie. I've seen, uh, it was better than a lot of movies I've seen, you know. I agree. I mean, it was well made, had great actors and everything, but because the executives were out there snorting coke and getting hookers and all the other shit, uh, the movie was in debt, you know, and it ruined a great movie. The potential could have been huge for that movie, huge blockbuster, if it hadn't been for the debt. And the company that had done it. So, you know, that's why I'm interested in finding out if something was going on with Mel Brooks at this time that he did this, that he directed this movie, because it, something was up. It just doesn't make any sense to have so much potential right in front of you and it just gets squandered. You know, it's just, I don't know. This doesn't seem proper. Let me, let me try to cheer you up a little bit. Okay. okay. There's a movie that we're watching next week. Mm -hmm. And, my schedule changes to what I was originally sold when I first went to this uh, new job, which I, I'm not saying I well, don't mind. It's only been mind. two weeks. It's only been two weeks. Yeah, but so no, I don't want you rushing into nothing. You got to no, keep. I, I, I want to be great. I want to be really good. You are gonna. You are. 
You're going to do that. This, this is a very serious job. It's 12 hours of driving a truck and, and sucking up grease traps and being speedy all day. So I uh -huh. need sleep. I'm sorry about that. But next week, we're going to be reviewing a movie directed by Robert Zemeckis. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good guy. It was yeah. written by Zemeckis and a guy named Robert Gale. And uh, it stars Kurt Russell, Jack Warden, and Garrett Graham. We're watching the 1980 comedy film, which is a classic, Used Car. Oh. Used cars, that's right. Okay. And we're going to be watching that. And uh, I haven't seen this one either. <laughs> like snorting hookers? Okay. Like that that's a used car thing. I mean, <laughs> like that car salesmanship sort of thing to happen. Like most of my friends that sell cars, they, they, they experiment with the Yayo. Used cars is a classic fucking movie. And if you're ever in the sales business, this is a movie that's required watching. Uh, mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to say. This is a, a funny little film. I'm looking forward to seeing this. I haven't seen it in over 30 years. Like all the films that I used to watch back in the day when I had a Betamax in the house, you know, like, oh, yeah. Well, now I don't live with mom and dad anymore, so I don't have those Betamax movies. And I'm pretty certain those Betamax movies are, are toast. Used cars. Yeah. Um, I appreciate everybody being here today. And Janet, is there anything else in, in forms of entertainment that you want to discuss things? Um, the politics, but that would ruin the stream where we're talking about yeah. a comedy movie. But no, uh, I, I'm excited about watching this movie. I love Kurt Russell, and um, I haven't seen it before, so we I'm just excited. I watched another it. Kurt Russell film a lot long ago called uh, Overboard. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like that's it. one of the funniest comedy, romantic comedies of the 1980s. It I don't know good. what it is, but that's got him and Goldie Hawn. Mm -hmm. And it was it was a very well-made movie and it was really funny. And yeah. it had Rod McDowell in it. You know I love Rod McDowell. He's a really phenomenal actor. I liked I, his movies. I, I could watch about every Roddy McDowell film there is. Um very talented. There, there's a there's a few actors from the 80s that the more I watch films and I see them like Robert Preston I want to watch every film he's done. Mm -hmm. And I probably need to start with The Sound of Music. But there's movies before that, before he was given that golden opportunity to, to make himself like everybody's favorite uh, what German. Was the horror. one where he went to town and he gets, he's like um, getting all the people uh, to sing and dance in the streets and stuff. And I cannot remember the name of it. My mom really liked him. And it was uh, not, I don't remember the name of the movie. I can't you remember. Turned, you turned me on to Robert Preston. I always have loved. He was wearing a striped suit and he had like a cane and a hat on and he was singing in the streets with the people and getting them to come out and sing and dance. I cannot remember the name of the movie. It was one of my mom's favorite ones because my mom loved musicals because she got me to watch Victor Victoria with Robert Preston in it. And then you liked the movie, the one, the video game one when he was in it. Yeah, well, of course. I mean, that, that's like a piece of my childhood, you know, Last yeah. Starfighter. Uh, uh, yeah, The Last Starfighter. But he was just a good actor. He was very, very talented. Yeah, he, he's one of the best actors. And sadly, he died after uh, 1986. Mm -hmm. The last movie he was in was The Last Starfighter. And there's a lot of his character. That he, he says there's a lot of his character from the movie Sound of Music and the character for Centauri. And that was just one of those really. That's great... what it was from. What the scene in my head that I'm thinking about from a movie that I remember my mother watching, and uh, she had it on a tape or something, and she used to watch it a lot. Maybe that's what it was, Sound of Music. And it was he wearing like a red and white striped outfit? I think so. <laughs> and, a and a cane. That might be it then, because I just remember my mom loving that movie and watching it with my grandma in the living room. And I don't remember how old I was, but I remember her watching it and 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 liking it. I mean, enjoying it, laughing and smiling a lot. So I just remember that. And the him wearing that outfit and dancing, you know, around with other people in the street. I just remember that one scene. So uh, she just really liked Robert Preston movies. Robert Preston's such a good actor. I mean, he's he's one of those few actors that you can watch and you can see his stuff when you're a young man. You can see it when you're older and it, it will hit really different i just go through some stills julie andrews what yeah, a I love part. julie andrews too
I think this might be the film you're discussing because there's a lot of musical numbers where they change outfits. Uh -huh. If I see it, I'll say, that's it. But I haven't seen anything like it yet. If, if you're a wealthy individual and you want to see Janet dress up, go ahead and uh, we'll get her sizes uh, uh, approximated. <laughs> but if you want to see her dress up in a drindle, like, I don't think you have a drindle, do you? No. Okay. But if I had time, I could make one because there's no place to rent anything like that here. When I lived yeah, in New Orleans, they're, they're, they're like hundreds, <laughs> if not thousands of dollars. Yeah, I know. But wouldn't she beautiful? Yeah. And she had that voice of an angel. I I, I don't know where the voice came from. I remember seen... her son was in the movie Victor Victoria as one of the dancers. Mm hmm for that we talked about that yeah well there was a nun i have that i could wear that outfit <laughs> the the mother superior so i'm uh, if i damn it for being a freak okay <laughs> <laughs> i love that movie though that was a fun that was a fun review for the blues brothers god i I miss, the, I miss that guy right there christopher Plummer. he's hell of an actor Mm -hmm. And he's one of the silver age. I, I would say he's silver age Hollywood. He really, he, he made a, a hell of a lot of great films. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So many good, good actors that we've lost. The beginners remember all the money in the world, the insider, like you, mm -hmm. th those four right there. That's, that, that's, that's like a day of amazing films. You just, you'd sit in your, your coziest chair, get up and stretch between, or maybe, you know, 45 minutes into a movie, get up, stretch, have an intermission, kiss your spouse, pet the dog, tell the kids go outside, sort of thing. But yeah. he, he was such a good actor. Damn it. Howard Lovecraft and Frozen Kingdom is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. That's a 4.9. I feel so good that that movie's at 4.9. Mm -hmm. I like Lovecraft. Lovecraft is a really interesting set of of uh, eldritch horror stuff which we'll get into that one of these days you've already watched a few movies that are like that mm -hmm. we are going to watch the blob here soon what was the movie you were talking about the other day you wanted us to review uh best little whorehouse in texas yeah with dolly Parton and burt reynolds somebody was talking about burt reynolds uh somewhere and I was like, yeah. And there was, everyone always says Smoking the Bandit. I don't know why, but that seems like Burt Reynolds, I guess, is one of his biggest movies or something. Why but I, but I, I, my mother loved Dolly in The Best Little Horse in Texas. And she thought that was a great movie. So I was like, oh, you know, and it's getting close to my mom's birthday again. So I started thinking about, you know, the stuff that my mom and I used to watch, you know, on TV or things like that. So that would be a fun movie to watch. Have you seen it? It's a musical too. They sing a little bit <laughs> and it's you're, funny. You're, you're dragging me into this one. So, but it's a good movie and it's fun. Okay. okay. I, for some reason, you like I, think, Reynolds? I thought Sylvester Stallone was a lead in this movie. Mm -mm. I think it's Burt Reynolds from what I remember. It's been a very long time since I watched it, but um, I just remember my mom liked Burt Reynolds. So, yeah. fair enough. I mean, I like Burt Reynolds as well, but I Did you know I there was a song that came out with Pitbull and Dolly Parton. No. Yeah, it's a song something about she's singing nine to five, and he sings along with her about how it's something, I guess they did it for Women's Day or something. I don't know, but I heard it and I was like, my daughter was playing it in her car and I was like, what? This is the song of Pitbull. I like Pitbull. And I said, but it's got Dolly in it. And they sang together in this, in this, for this song. And I was really surprised. So I downloaded it to my music <laughs> repertoire. <laughs> it's pretty good. I'll have to send it to you so you can hear it. Cause I don't want to get you in trouble for, you know, music. From you know this channel, <laughs> they don't like that stuff. It happens. Yeah, it it happens. Um, appreciate everybody being here today. 
we've taken we, we've kind of dragged out a few minute few minutes in this and wanted to discuss some other things that were going on and other movies so appreciate everybody being here as they were you got 89 people in chat some of you from twitter some of you from janet's youtube some from mine if you can please give a like share and subscribe wherever you're at be aware that janet puts out content all the time so be very well subscribed to her social media she has a lot of it uh, i recommend her on rumble because you're going to catch janet saying things over there that she can't say elsewhere yeah. and uh, just watch <laughs> yourself just keep your head on a swivel mm -hmm. janet do you want to watch walk us out for the day well i just want to say thank you to everyone who, who stopped in, in to hang out with us we we're we're sorry that we are changing it from monday nights like we used to do but uh with bruce's job it's more important he needs to you know take care of himself and his family and that's just number one priority which is what i would you know why i like him so much and why we're such good friends because he's a good man and um I just want to say thank you to everyone and I hope that maybe you'll stop by and see me uh, Friday night when we do the Friday night shit show at nine central time. So there you go. <laughs> Fantastic. Everybody, thank you for being here today. We will see you soon. If you want more of Janet with her playing Dungeons and Dragons, swing by my channel on Saturday of this coming week. She will be playing her character Luna with the grizzled old vets. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.